All right. Hello, everyone uh, in the world on Facebook Live and wherever else you're watching. Um, thanks for joining us for our Cal Fireside Chat. We need some like, we need some like cool intro music for these. Um, that will be a recommendation for next time. Um, so uh, we have some, we have a really great conversation for us today. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about what we're doing, um, Cal Fireside Chats are our fun and informal conversations with Cal staff and network leaders on issues and topics impacting our Asian Minnesotan community. Um, and I know that we uh, invited some of our donors to tune in for these Facebook Lives. So thank you to all of you who, who are joining us today as well. My name is Nick Kaur. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I am uh, calling in from Minneapolis and, um, and uh, I am the senior manager of movement building at Cal. And I have a very special guest today, uh, MJ Carpio, uh, my dear friend, uh, my dear Cal leader, uh, my dear movement builder, um, and also organizer at, uh, on the Yes for Minneapolis campaign. Um, and we're gonna be talking about, um, about public safety this year. We're gonna be talking about what's at stake in Minneapolis, particularly around um, the question two ballot uh, measure um, on creating a new Department of Public Safety. And so I'm gonna uh, just, uh, number one, first of all, let MJ introduce herself uh, and just say a little bit about who you are and uh, what brings you here today. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, hey, my name is MJ. I use she, her, and Sha pronouns. Uh, that's a Tagalog uh, gender neutral pronoun, if you are wondering. Um, and I'm one of the organizers at Yes for Minneapolis. I do a lot of field work. I do a lot of uh, direct voter engagement and uh, volunteer recruitment. Um, and it's basically a lot of uh, voter awareness uh, work that I do at Yes for Minneapolis. Awesome, awesome. So, um, so Cal is a uh, coalition partner on the Yes for Minneapolis campaign. Um, and so MJ, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what question two is all about. What does it say? What does it mean? And why should we as Asian Americans, Asian Minnesotans care about question two? Sure. So uh, ballot question two is about creating a Department of Public Safety that is more expansive and integrative and holistic. So what that means is taking a public health approach to public safety so that police officers can work alongside other qualified professionals such as uh, mental health responders, uh, violence interrupters, drug addiction experts, homelessness outreach specialists. Um, basically, other we would like, we want uh, to establish alternative responses for situations that don't require armed responding. Uh, because currently, the way that the structure is built is that you know armed police responding is the only thing that's mandated, um, and that's what's on the Minneapolis Charter. Uh, AKA, or you can think of it as the constitution. Um, so we would just like for there to be an expanded uh, public safety so that when you call 911, uh, you can get appropriate help. And sometimes that looks like just a mental health check. Uh, sometimes that looks like um, both a mental health check and a police officers. And sometimes it'll be a police officer, um, but it doesn't matter. We want to be able to provide appropriate right-sized responding to calls. Yeah, thanks, thanks oh, for that. Oh, I, I forgot to I forgot to answer why uh, Asian yeah, Minnesotans. Ahead. Yeah, I forgot to answer why Asian Minnesotans should care about it. Um, a lot of uh, you know impacted by police brutality are actually uh, immigrants and refugees, particularly Southeast Asian uh, refugees and immigrant populations, and sometimes when things happen, they don't require armed responding, right? And so we also want our community members to be able to call 911 and ask for alternative responding. Um, and that's also true across other immigrant and refugee populations, not just the Asian population, but it's definitely a point of solidarity uh, to, to have a vested interest in this. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that I think about as well, especially after this like past year is, you know, we're seeing a lot of, you know, a rise in anti-Asian 
hate and violence and <clears throat> that is all connected to safety as well right that's connected to like the type of safety system we see and we have and often what we've been hearing from folks is that you know um right now the only way to report incidents is through the police um and many times people don't really feel like they don't feel um like safe to report the police they don't feel like like if they report it, anything will happen. Um, and so what does this, what does this mean for that? What, is, what does it mean for like folks who are sort of like, um, you know, really thinking about what's been happening this past year? Sure. Um, well, we know, yes, that yes, there is uh, a rise in anti-Asian hate. We also know that, uh, you know, certain demographics are played out to be enemies uh, when in fact they're not, um, you know, these tensions are, are purposely, you know, propagated, but it's just not true. So a lot of what we're hearing from our fellow Asian Americans or fellow, fellow Asians is that, yeah, they would like to call the police, but they recognize that in some cases it would actually just escalate the situation. And so they don't wanna have to call the police and cause possible death. Um, that's one aspect. And the other aspect is, um, yeah, so that's one aspect. And the other aspect is that it, it really does depend on what you look like when you call the police and how seriously they take you. So if you are looking, you know, like us, uh, they might not take you as seriously. And that might cause, uh, and they have been known to cause harm to us unless we are side by side next to a white friend or a white family member, we're just not taken as seriously as well. So it's, it's like these, this, um, the treatment of, of uh, Asian populations and other BIPOC populations, we just know that it's, uh, it tends towards violence, disrespect and not being taken seriously. And that's why it's important to have alternative responses so that they don't end in violence, death, or um, even if it's just disrespect, right? Yeah, I think about like, what would it be like if an incident happened and like we called 911 or whatever the number is and like someone came who was actually there who would be like, I have all of these, these are the services that I, that I like that are here to support you, right? And it's like, it can be maybe even a trusted community member. It doesn't have to be someone from the government, but it can be like someone from one of our organizations who have been contracted to actually be the ones who are responding to situations like this. We're like, it's a trusted community member. And like, I have like support for you. I have like this, I have services and resources to support the traumatic experience that you just had. And I can help report it to the right authorities so it actually gets reported and like people can investigate that. Like, that's what I'm thinking about, right? Like we can actually think differently about how mm -hmm. we respond to all of these different situations, right? Um, yeah. And that's what really excites me about this. Yeah, go ahead, you wanted to say something. <laughs> uh, well, two things. You said uh, call 911 if that's the number. I wanna clarify that 911 is not going to disappear uh, if, if ballot initiative two passes. It is not going to disappear. We are not getting rid of 911 calls to the police if that's what we ask for. Um, it just means expanding what we can ask for. And the, the second thing is that, yeah, you brought up uh, community resources. Um, community, it, and I don't think it matters on the demographic, but in particular BIPOC communities are really good at taking care of each other, but those are under-resourced, they're underfunded. And so we already have models within our, our particular and specific communities. We're just trying to scale it up a little bit and to make it more sustainable. Um, yeah, those are the two things. <laughs> awesome. Um, and can you talk about sort of like what both like, what is the context in which we like are coming into this at um, and then also like, What's at stake around this? Sure. Um, well, the context is that, uh, you know, George Floyd was murdered um, last summer, 2020. And the question of whether we should create a 
uh, Department of Public Safety that's expanded and has a public health approach, it could have been on the ballot in 2020. But this unelected body called the Charter Commission vetoed that. And so then we went a different route of collecting over 22,000 signatures to get this on the ballot. And that's like a, a very democratically robust way of getting um, ballot initiatives in. Um, and that's true for uh, ballot question three, uh, which is for rent stabilization. Um, I can't speak too much on that. I'm just giving you a, a different example of how um, signature collection and gathering community voices, how that can get us um, on ballot initiatives. And so what's at stake is that so many people have, well, so many people have been uh, activated, awakened since the murder of George Floyd and uh, the uprisings from last summer. And they just know if, the, you know, so many people already knew that uh, the realities of police brutality, but now even more people are aware that it really depends on the color of your skin and what you look like, whether you're affected by that. And so this was uh, a, waking, a waking up moment for, for a lot of us. And a lot of people recognize that, how could, how could you go back? <laughs> what is the alternative? There's no alternative. Uh, ballot question two is the only initiative right now that's trying to establish a Department of Public Safety so that we can provide alternative responses. There's no other alternative. The alternative is remaining in the status quo. And that's what is terrifying <laughs> um, for people who have been affected by police brutality and not alike. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing and reminder for us is that like this is the alternative right this is like what people have been working towards this whole year and a half ever since George Floyd was murdered was this thing and a reminder that like for me as I was one of the things that I think about like after that happened was that like there were so many people who were out on the streets calling for change in that moment um and still calling for change now um, but, you know, I, I've, I've worked in the Twin Cities for so long as an organizer and in like that full month, I had never seen that level of energy and that level of people who are getting involved because they felt like they had to do something like I had never seen that before in my life, like regular people who are like going to the corner, like holding up a sign because like they wanted to do something, not because like a sign would actually like make that much of a difference, but because they felt the need to like go out and like like do something with their friends and like make a difference right like that's like the type of energy that was calling for this change and that's the type of energy that is on the ballot this year as well um that's those are some of the things that i think about um just a reminder to folks that uh to ask questions in the chat um if you have questions for me or mj or a, a questions about Yes on two, uh, questions about the, uh, the charter amendment, questions about MJ and who she is, <laughs> what she does in her free time. <laughs> um, so yeah, can you say like, can you talk about, you know, speaking of you personally, like why is this important to you personally? Like, why are you working on this thing? Why are you spending, you know, 10 to 12 hours every day of the week, like invested to like, make sure this thing passes. Yeah, seven days a week. Um, <laughs> this is important to me because I think it goes back to your comment about um, communities caring for each other. Um, that, <laughs> that matters a lot to me. I was raised by a village, took a village to raise me, but that's currently not the model that we have. It's just not very sympathetic or compassionate. More often it's, it's reactive and violent instead of proactive and preventive, right? Um, and, and I care about being proactive and preventive um, in terms of catching people, meeting them where they're at instead of responding with um, violence. Um, and, that, and then, so that's one layer, uh, which is that, you know, having been raised by community that inspires me a lot. The other one is we, you know, my friends and I have been reimagining systems in just in general. And when it comes to public safety in particular, um, it's really difficult to reimagine public safety because of the way that the Minneapolis Charter 
is written. It's it's very at least when it comes to the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, the Minneapolis Police Department is the only department that is unilaterally controlled by the mayor. Um, and so then certain staffing is required and certain budgeting is then allocated to that. But that's not the way uh, that the rest of the other 20 city departments work. Uh, and I'm talking about the health department, the fire department, uh, the public works department. Uh, they're overseen by both city council and the mayor. Um, and so it's really hard to reimagine public safety when on the charter itself is this very inflexible thing that says, well, no, only the mini only the police officers should be required to respond to all of these like array of issues and problems. Um, and yeah, it's hard to execute, or it's hard to execute your dreams if the barrier itself is the city constitution. Um, and so I want to, I want alternative responses. And the most tangible way of doing that is by changing the charter. And that's why this is so important to me. Yeah. And so for folks who are not aware, uh, maybe you can, you kind of alluded to this, but like, what does it mean? What is the charter for the city? Sure. So the charter is like the city constitution. It then determines um, the ordinances, which are below that. Um, and, and those ordinances are much more flexible and, and they're, they get reviewed much more frequently and staffing levels of, of, of jobs or positions um, and budgeting for those are much more flexible. But the Minneapolis Police Department is the only one that has the staffing requirement in the charter. It is an anomaly in the state of Minnesota. Other, uh, other cities in Minnesota don't have a Minneapolis Police Department in their charter, yet police departments exist, right? And their staffing and budgeting processes are, they're, they're still there, but they're just not so rigid. And I want to I wanna clarify too that the, the charter that I'm talking about where the Minneapolis Police Department is mandated, that was lobbied in 1-4 in 1961, so before the civil rights. And so this is, again, very important for so many historical reasons, right, um, that we are stuck with this 1961 model when we are in 2021 and George Floyd was murdered in 2020 and we, we marched, we organized. And so how could you how could you still say no and be like, no, I would I think I would like to remain with the 1961 model, even though we have 2021 problems in the middle of a pandemic that's like exacerbating so many things. No, I think I'd like to keep the status quo. I find that um, just hard <laughs> to wrap my head around. I, I would like to move forward. I'd like to pass uh, ballot initiative two, and that way we can be more flexible with uh, the kinds of, of staffing levels and the kinds of uh, responders that we have. Yeah, and thank you for that reminder that this was put into place in 1961, all the way before, you know, so much of, you know, so many things had even happened. And this is still in place today um, mm -hmm. around like the requirement number of police officers in the city. And a reminder that, you know, really what policing in Minneapolis and across the United States actually stems from, right? Like it stems from a history of white supremacy and racism and slave catching and, and protecting, you know, white owners and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I just want to, to clarify that, it, the, it, you know, that yes, we're Minneapolis, yes, it is a campaign, but it's also a coalition of over 70 plus grassroots organizations that are a range um, a range in, in ways of thinking about reform or um, things like that. And yeah, but there's one thing that we all want and recognize, which is that something needs to change in the charter. There has to be systemic change regardless of where you are on the scale. And, and it also doesn't really matter what you look like, what color of skin you are. A lot of people recognize that we want police and we want alternative responses. And this is the only thing that's offering that right now. Um, I just wanna add that there is a state statute uh, that mandates that police officers respond to certain kinds of situations uh, as they should. They are the ones who are trained 
and should be trained to respond to those. Um, and so we're not, we are not abolishing the police. We're asking for an expanded public safety. Yeah, I was just gonna ask you that, you know, cause people have been <laughs> telling me that this is gonna abolish the police. So like, what do you say to that? Impossible. <laughs> there is a state statute that hangs over the city charter. Um, so yeah, we can't get rid of the police. It's not possible. And it's also not what a lot of people want regardless of um, the color of their skin or their culture. So to be clear, this would have police officers and it would have other things within this new Department of Public Safety. Mm -hmm. So that people can be, you know, responding to the things that they're trained to respond to and they can be good at their job and they're not stretched thin. They're not asked to do things that they are not properly equipped to deal with. And there are a lot of, um, for example, during the Chauvin trial, uh, Chief Arredondo himself testified that a lot of 911 calls don't require armed responding, right? Um, and we just also know from firsthand experience of, of our friends and families, community members, they wish they had a, other people to call. Um, yeah, agreed. I, I think I read a report from, in, in, this is in the city of St. Paul, but it's very similar where uh, from the Citizens League, where about 90% of their calls did not require an armed responder to actually respond to those things. It's a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, it's a big part of someone's job and you can not have that happen and, and they can focus on other things. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what happens if this thing passes and what happens if this thing does not pass? Sure, um, if this passes, um, City Council and Mayor have 30 days to appoint an interim commissioner. Um, so a lot like, so I had mentioned earlier the 20 other city departments, that's how they operate. City Council nominates and uh, the mayor approves of a commissioner, a chief or a head. Um, they're called by different names. So then for the first 30 days, the only thing that needs to happen is City Council and the mayor need to nominate and approve an interim uh, commissioner and they're perfectly capable of doing that. They do that for the other um, city departments. And then the rest are, you know, they're gonna take longer than 30 days realistically, like the ordinance writing, um, and it's gonna take a lot of community input. So the same people who were marching and felt uh, empowered and felt like they, you know, had to speak up and do something, that can continue after the 30 days after this passes. They should they should be advocating for themselves and advocating for the kind of reimagined public safety system that they want. Um, and that's what the Department of Public Safety uh, should get um, is community input. So that's what will happen. And if this doesn't pass, well, then the Minneapolis Police Department remains to be the only city department that is unilaterally controlled by the mayor. Um, and it's also the only, city department that's received a lot of headlines of you know corruption and and brutality and violence against community so yeah there isn't really an alternative um so we just stay where we are in the 1961 ways of thinking instead of 2021 great and um a couple of things um we, I know we have four minutes left, so maybe you can ask, answer this question quickly. What are you hearing from people when you're talking to them on the doors and in, in neighborhoods? Particularly yeah, sure. other Asian folks. Particularly what? Other Asian folks. <laughs> sure. Um, a lot of people are really excited for change, um, which isn't to say that a lot of people would like things to remain the same. So, you know, we don't have to walk on eggshells around that. We have a range of, of people behind this. Um, but once you explain to them what we're trying to create, uh, which is an expanded public safety, then they really, once they understand that, once they click in their heads that, oh yeah, I guess, I guess armed responding isn't necessary for that. Or, oh yeah, this one time that this happened to my friend and, or, and, or my family member, that didn't need to happen. So once you, explain to them what we're trying to create, then they totally get behind it. Um, which isn't to say that some people are already convinced by uh, fear-based messaging uh, of the opposition, which is baseless. And yeah, it's, it's just based on fear um, and, 
and wanting to spread chaos, that they think this is going to be a chaotic thing. No. Um, but yeah, people are excited for change and they understand um, that this is what has to happen to, to kickstart the changes that we want, which is voting yes on two. <laughs> and how do people vote yes on two? MJ, tell us. And when? Um, so, <laughs> so the election is on November 2nd. That's the last uh, day to vote. Uh, but like, yeah. Um, so you can find your polling place for that. You can also uh, do early voting. That's on 90, 980 East Hennepin um, is the early voting site in Minneapolis. Um, I will have to get back to you on mail-in applications. I don't quite remember if the application for that has passed. Um, I think it's probably too late to apply, but if you have yeah. your ballot, you can turn it in until the yeah. election. Yeah. So. Yes, and yeah, too late um, to apply, but you can still turn in your ballot just to be safe. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah. um, and you can find your polling location at mnvotes.org, and that's where you'll find out where you can vote on election day. Otherwise, you can vote early now, starting now, all the way up until the election, um, at the uh, early voting location in Northeast Minneapolis. Um, and, you know, a couple other things, Cal is doing door knocking to get out the vote and to uh, talk to Asian, uh, Asian Americans in Minneapolis about what's at stake in this election, particularly around question two. So we are doing that on Saturday, October 23rd and uh, Saturday, October 30th. Uh, we're going to drop the link in the chat. Um, and um, another thing that we're doing um, for next week, stay tuned for next week. Um, we are uh, going to talk next Friday at noon uh, for our next fireside chat about St. Paul rent stabilization. So there is a ballot question in St. Paul about rent stabilization and Cal is also a coalition partner on that campaign as well. So we'll be talking to uh, Trump, who is the campaign manager uh, for Keep St. Paul Home. And, um, and yeah, thank you so much, MJ, for joining us this was you know just 30 30 minutes is not long enough to have a conversation with mj carpio anything you want to add mj uh days until november 22nd just to give people an idea it's 19 days please go november out and 2nd vote. not 22nd november 2nd there's 19 days remaining until november 2nd so please 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 make a plan to vote you have the right to vote uh check with your employers because you have you should be able to reserve time to vote on november 2nd and if you can vote early please vote early. It's your right and you 